Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here and I'm very happy to be able to present my work in this setting. So, my academic work is concerned with probabilistic models and functional neural imaging. So, probabilistic models are at the heart of all the scientific and academic activities that I'm involved in. What do I mean by probabilistic models? Well, I just mean joint distributions over potentially very many random variables, some of which of them may be observed and then modeling um, data, and some of them of which may not be observed and modeling latent states, for example, in the brain or um, parameters in um, biophysical models of neuroimaging data. And uh, these form of joint distributions over many random variables are involved in all of my academic activities and specifically um, over three levels. Um, first in data science education, so in my teaching work where they uh, feature prominently in statistical methods and the machine learning teaching that I do. Um, then they are at the heart of the functional new imaging analysis development that I'm um, working on. And here they take the form of, for example, non-parametric variational and classical inference schemes. And um, last but not least in the work that we do on computational cognitive neuroscience where we try to understand what the brain does and how it does it. And here these probabilistic models um, take the form of, for example, the Bayesian brain hypothesis and Markov decision processes. So in the following, I would like to um, give you two examples um, from my research work. Um, first on functional neural imaging an analysis development and consolidation, and then on computational cognitive neuroscience with respect um, to uh, data science education. Of course, we will see um, probabilistic models again later on in the Leopold. So the first example that I want to discuss is um, an example um, where we um, yeah, investigated classical inference in uh, functional neural imaging analysis. And this work is motivated as uh, follows. So this work is called Power Calculations for Relative Field Theory yes, uh, FMRI Experiment. And um, it's about classical inference. And I have to say, I'm somewhat surprised to talk about classical inference in 2019, because when I first started in new imaging um, around 2006, I thought um, classical inference would be a thing of the past by the end of my PhD. But then, as you are all aware, it turned out that there was quite some discussion about classical inference in um, fMRI research, um, which is also accompanied by um, a lot of discussion on the question of um, power in uh, neural imaging studies and a more general feeling that uh, maybe reproducibility and, um, yeah, and, and reliability of the results that we report in fMRI are not as good as they could be. And then only this year there was in human brain mapping a special section um, on the topic of cluster inference, um, cluster failure, which is of course uh, related closely to classical inference and hence um, yeah, it still seems to be an important topic. And our contribution here is um, to basically look into the question of power analysis in classical inference, because this is also uh, um, demanded by many in the community. So what are we uh, talking about um, really? So what um, I'm um, concerned with, and of course most of the field is concerned with, is um, the inferences that we do, for example, based on this SPM table, which is the typical outcome of a um, JLM-based univariate um, fMRI data analysis. And um, although, of course, there are many methods uh, around right now, it turns out if you look into the literature and do biometric analysis, um, these kind of uh, classical inferences using, for example, SPM or FSL, which also implements random field theory based uh, testing, um, remain fairly popular. So, SPM uh, accounting for around 70% of the published literature, most of them using random field theory for um, inference, and um, particularly um, uh, prominent being uh, the cluster level inference test that Eklund et al. also um, discussed. So in contrast to Eklund et al., um, my take on this is not uh, so much that all of these p-values are fundamentally flawed and that's a big problem. This is actually a fairly well-developed and fairly deep um, theoretical framework. 
However, what I found was that I never could really grasp what these p-values are because you have these uh, papers from the 90s, but they are kind of building on each other and then they might also not reflect what's actually implemented today. So the first thing when looking into this question is classical inference valid, how can we do power calculation, was to produce um, uh, yeah, in-depth mathematical and computational review of this framework, which um, is this random field theory based p-values review of the SPM implementation where we basically present all the mathematical background and then a um, yeah, detailed documentation of the p-values that are um, involved in this SPM table. Um, so what then about power? If you look into the literature, you don't find much. So um, the bottom line of um, this is that um, random field theory based p-values remain popular in valid statistical testing tools. So um, they are there, they are being used, and, and they are valid. If you really look closely at what followed up to, after Eglon, with the main thing is about the cluster form, uh, forming a threshold. But then if uh, we want to calculate power um, for the tests that are done um, based on random field theory, um, there is not much around and specifically for things like cluster extent uh, test uh, power calculations do not exist. So uh, I uh, said out, okay, if we want to compute power and we all do random field theory based p-values, so somebody has to um, develop a power country for that and then I decided that I might do that. So to tell you then about this work, um, I'd like first to um, briefly recap um, the probabilistic model that is behind this random field theory based fMRI experiment, uh, inference, sorry, and um, this probabilistic model um, that uh, we are looking here uh, at is the second level um, continuous space discrete contrast of parameter estimate data point model where for each participant you have of course one uh, contrast of your better parameters and you analyze them at the second level and the model behind that is that you um, observe uh, some data everywhere in 3D um, search space continuously over space and all of these are of course random variables so you have infinitely um, or uncountable even random variables um, over space for each participant. Um, in structural form, this model can be uh, expressed then as follows. So the um, observation of the eye participant to participant at uh, location X in 3D space is given by the value of a um, um, mean or expectation function that is um, one for all participants, but then the ith participant is realized by adding to this uh, mean function uh, Z um, random field, um, which is um, weighted by some um, um, the standard deviation and parameter. And then of course, in terms of um, First of all, the uh, computational approximation. We, of course, don't observe these uh, models everywhere in space, but we observe them at the location where the voxels uh, are located. Um, and then they take this typical form, as you're all familiar with, from fMRI analysis, where you have um, um, data for um, n voxels and um, I, um, um, n um, participants. Yeah. And the um, crucial thing now, of course, is if you uh, have this model, then of course, in the, uh, from the perspective of null hypothesis significance testing, you assume that um, this mean function is zero and you ask um, certain statistics, um, what is the probability to uh, appear under the null hypothesis? Yeah. So this is then the null model um, for which um, statistics distribution have been approximated and we can compare our observed data to these um, distribution of the statistics. So what are these statistics? That depends, and that depends on uh, where you look at, whether you look at the voxel or the cluster level, and you look at in an uncorrected or a corrected setting. So um, in the single test scenario, when you're looking at uncorrected uh, inference, then of course at the voxel level, these are the t values, which are reported in the SPM uh, table, and um, their uh, probability distributions under the null hypothesis um, are given in, in this column. The cluster level, this is the cluster extent, which is evaluated based on a um, yeah, somewhat intricate algorithm and um, their um, values and uh, their associated p-values under the null hypothesis in a single test scenario reports in this column of the SPM table. Now, of course, in fMRI, we're all aware of the multiple testing uh, problem and hence uh, family-wise error corrective inference is um, something that is um, yeah, very prominent. And um, the uh, distributions for um, 
family was um, family was error corrected inference um, result from the maximum statistic at the voxel level and the cluster uh, the maximum statistic at the cluster level so the question is what is the distribution of the maximum over all um, possible t values what is the distribution of the um, maximum cluster extent over the observed um, clusters and um, the um, distributional results for the observed uh, data are then given in these columns of the um, SPN table. So that's basically the test that we are um, doing based on a statistical model. Now we want to talk about power and of course uh, when we want to talk about power and evaluate um, the necessary sample size that we um, need to um, achieve a certain level of power um, is that we first need to define power. And of course we are all aware in the single test scenario where you have one uh, null hypothesis um, and the um, complementary alternative uh, hypothesis that power is defined as the probability that the test rejects the null hypothesis if the alternative is true. And that's fine and we all know this kind of power. In the multiple testing scenario it gets a little bit more complex and the reason for that is that we are of course now testing multiple um, hypotheses here m hypothesis so the number of um, voxels for example um, and these um, null hypotheses um, yeah, sorry um, in the multiple testing scenario we um, test multiple um, hypotheses and we partition the um, parameter space many times into an hypothesis and alternative hypothesis now the, it can be that some of these alternative hypotheses are true all of them are true or none of them are true and um, basically the model under which we evaluate power can um, varies with uh, the number of um, true alternative hypotheses um, based on this notion, um, we now can, um, we also need to think about the um, test, um, which also, of course, can um, be either um, detect, um, which can also either detect all of the true uh, alternative hypotheses on one or, or so. So we have to be um, a little bit careful there. And um, some useful notions of power in a multiple testing scenario are minimal power which is the probability to detect at least one of the true um, alternative hypotheses. So that's um, basically if you have like uh, you test 1000 uh, hypotheses, in reality 500 them of them are um, the alternative hypotheses are true and you detect one or up to 500. Um, what's the probability for this? This is um, minimal power. And the other um, form of power is maximum power, which um, is the probability to detect all of the true alternative hypotheses. Yeah? So let's say again we have 1000 hypotheses, 20 of them are true, you detect 20, and what's the probability of that? That's uh, maximum power. Yeah? So maximum power is of course harder to achieve, but of course it also depends on how many uh, um, uh, hypotheses are actually true. Now, based on these definitions um, and with the help of the maximum statistic and the minimum statistic, which can, we can easily evaluate based on the distribution of the maximum statistic, um, we can um, evaluate minimal and maximum uh, power. And um, the, the statistics that we need for that and their corresponding um, null distributions can actually quite readily be derived from standard and field theory approximations. Um, now, for all, um, Alternative hypothesis being true, the power functions, um, so power as a function of number of participants and current D can um, be derived um, from the non-central uh, resal densities, which have also been uh, proposed already. And um, what remains to be done is that we specify the proportion of true alternative hypothesis. And to do that, just briefly, in our framework, um, we assume that um, a certain subset of the search space um, which we um, parameterize by lambda is activated. So this lambda is essentially um, corresponding to the percentage where we say, okay, the uh, alternative hypothesis is true and uh, in the remainder it's not true. And this can then be used in the approximations um, to the probability distributions of the relevant statistics to uh, compute uh, power under these um, uh, settings. 
So what is then the result? I'm skipping the uh, uncorrected versions here. I'm just focusing on the multiple testing scenario. So um, at the voxel level, when we look at minimal power and maximal power as a function of how much brain volume is activated, we look at power as a function of um, cones D, so the effect size and the number of participants. And we see that we can reach around 80% uh, or 0.8 of the power um, at minimum effect sizes with around 25 participants. We talk about maximum power, so the uh, um, probability of detecting all of the true alternative um, hypothesis, then um, we see that at medium effect size we need many more participants, so around 400 participants would here be required. Now, if we look at um, the uh, cluster level, um, things look a little bit more benign. So, for minimal power, um, we um, require again for medium effect size around 20 um, participants, maybe even less, so around 15. And for maximum power, so detecting all of the truly activated clusters, um, we um, need um, at medium effect size around 40 um, participants. And um, of course, these power functions are, um, are parametrically dependent on many things. So one thing is here our lambda parameter, and there are other things that play a role. Of course, the alpha level plays a role, the, um, so the significance level, the um, cluster forming threshold, the smoothness, all of these play a role, but I'm not uh, discussing them right now. I'm just showing you one example where we um, basically um, corrected, um, bias corrected um, the um, effect size estimate from a cluster that we have in a, a pilot study based on the effect size estimate by uh, Goethe et al. And then if we ask how much uh, participants do we need to achieve 80% of power, we find that at the voxel level for minimal power around 18, uh, for maximal power as we've seen uh, previously um, around um, 380, um, and um, at the um, cluster level minimal power around 12, and cluster level maximal power around um, 40 to 50. So, um, what's uh, the summary of all of this? First of all, random field theory based tests remain popular in neuroimaging. We require power and sample size calculations for random field theory based tests because they haven't been much around. We also actually put in positive predictive value calculations, which your needles likes a lot. Uh, I haven't discussed them at all. When we talk about power in multiple testing scenarios, we really have to be careful to di di distinguish different kinds of power. There is not just the power that we all know from our undergrad statistics. There are multiple types, and we have to be quite careful. So we developed power positive predictive values for uncorrected and corrected box and cluster level inference as implemented in SPM. Um, yeah, we use the standard statistic distribution approximations and we introduce this partial alternative hypothesis scenario. The bottom line is a maximum power at the corrected cluster level can be achieved with uh, 40 to 50 participants. Good, so that was um, the first part of my talk. Let's see, let me go on here. Hello. Um, and as a second example for the use of probabilistic models in functional neural imaging, I would like to now talk about our use of um, probabilistic models when we uh, try to understand human behavior, decision making, and how the brain works. And um, this line of work is uh, very much inspired by mass levels of analysis, which you're all familiar with, of course, um, where we distinguish a computational level and that asks what is the problem, an algorithmic level, how can this problem be tackled, and of course, the implementation level, how um, are these algorithms um, implemented in our case in the brain. Now, of course, this is very familiar. Um, what we are claiming and what we build our work on is that we can actually um, address uh, the computational level if we formulate a partially observable Markov decision process type models. So we need to we have a language to specify what the problem actually is. And then uh, we can, once we have specified the problem, actually tackle this um, using uh, ideas from Bayesian inference, dynamic programming, and reinforcement learning, which of course uh, um, have inbuilt the idea that um, something um, like Bayesian inference um, might happen in the brain, which is just a Bayesian brain hypothesis. And we'll come back to the implementation level later. So this um, project that we are doing here, which we call a trace of real-time dynamic program in the human brain, is kind of a prototypical project for a number of projects that are currently running in the lab with PhD students and master's students. So um, what we uh, did here is that we um, designed a task where participants have to find two treasures in a grid world. 
um, here shown from a bird's eye view. Um, the crucial thing is that um, participants do not um, uh, see this um, task in this way, but they see it from a first person perspective where they see where they are. And then importantly, they get some noisy observations of um, or noisy information about where the treasures may be. So um, they observe these observation bars and they can be light or dark and with a certain probability you come up light and dark depending on the distance and the direction of the uh, treasures. And then people are supposed to make a decision. And their aim is to recover um, the two targets in one attempt. And in each attempt, um, they start in the upper left corner. They have a, th a limited number of steps, which is related to the optimal path length to discover um, the treasures, but not um, identical so that this is decorrelated. Um, yeah, and um, they are supposed to perform this task. Um, this is an actual experiment, so we um, uh, recorded simultaneous behavior and fMRI data from nine participants. And uh, because a lot of these um, task components are um, sampled online, for example, where the um, treasures are, what the optimal path uh, which then determines what the optimal path length uh, is, and um, that we basically deviate from the optimal path length. We um, yeah, um, investigate the task statistics and see that basically we have um, roughly um, a uniform distribution over all possible settings. Now, to uh, work with this task from a um, computational cognitive neuroscience perspective. Um, the first thing that we always do when we have such a task is that we specify the computational level, what is the problem, using a task model where we then use concepts from um, the theory of partially observable non decision processes. So we specify essentially a number of sets that to capture the structural components of the task and a number of probability distributions that capture the um, dynamic aspects of the task. So for example, um, we need to specify a set of uh, um, task states, in this case the agent position and the participant position in the grid and the treasure positions, and um, we um, or the actions, which in this case are state dependent, um, because people at the edge um, of the um, grid would have other possible actions than in the middle. Importantly, what we are, of course uh, need to specify is um, how people or how action uh, how agents um, switch from state to state based on their actions and how these observation bars uh, come about based on the current state and the likelihood function. So that's always the first thing that we do in many projects to de uh, develop a task model. And then based on this task model, we can tackle this task model using different uh, algorithms, which we call um, artificial agents, which are of course a form of artificial intelligence. And um, what these artificial agents are, of course, just MATLAB objects that interact with um, a MATLAB um, task object. Object. Um, another way to view them, of course, or uh, what they implement are try by try information update rules. So they um, basically observe um, the. Um, um, their current location and if they observe a target um, and of course they need to somehow with um, the light bars and then make, need to make some sense of that. Um, in addition to yeah, basically um, updating the information about um, the entire task configuration, they um, allocate um, action valence on each uh, trial. So each time they need to basically decide how much, uh, how good is one of the possible actions, and then to take um, the one that they think is best. And of course, our agents that we develop um, are um, used um, by us as behavioral models. So um, when we um, use them, we um, um, design a set that kind of um, just uh, um, implements different possible strategies that uh, participants may, uh, may use. So in our case here, we use belief state free agents that implement uniform uh, random choice or a simple follow the light bar heuristic. Um, and belief state based uh, re uh, agents that form a representation of the task and do a, a simple uh, one step look ahead um, and may also have some information signal. Uh, all of these belief state based agents are, of course, uh, sequential Bayesian learners, so they update a state representation based on observations. So I'm just, of course, giving one example of an agent. So this agent here is belief state, so you can see this agent uh, 5 or A6. Um, you can see here the state, uh, um, the location of the agent, the location of the treasures, and the agent moves uh, through the grid uh, when it's interacting with it. It makes observations, so these light bars, and it builds um, with these based on these um, light bars, and of course the molecular function, it builds up um, a representation of where the treasures are over st um, steps. 
Now it also had needs to make a decision on each uh, time point, and um, the decision that is here being made is based on a um, belief state rate and L1 distance minimization. So basically, it um, um, considers for each um, possible action um, the distance um, um, that um, uh, that remains to a, a treasure and weighs this distance with um, the belief that there is um, a treasure. So um, a treasure that is very close and then has a very high probability to um, um, a note, uh, um, to contain a treasure um, is favored and then preferably chosen. Now um, we um, simulate these agents and for example see that a different agent is actually quite good in solving everything. Um, our uh, random choice agent is um, not good at all. But we of course not only simulate the agents but we then uh, embed them in a behavioral model where we do maximum likelihood estimation um, using standard uh, procedures and um, of course, we also study how well we can recover our models based on simulated data and our um, parameters. So um, what do we get? So um, in terms of performance, we see that, for example, our belief state-based agents are actually um, quite good. A purely information-seeking agent is not that good, and our uh, heuristic agents are also not that good and fairly comparable to the belief state-based agents to participant uh, behavior. If we um, do a formal model comparison, we um, find that um, our A5 model, which is not um, a perfect model, but uh, is best in explaining the participant data. Now, finally, we of course um, are, because this was an FMI experiment, we are also interested in the new correlates of that. So um, we use a standard um, fMRI, a computational fMRI approach, where we correlate internal variables of um, the winning model with um, the fMRI data, in our case, the belief update and the belief evaluation. So this would be the Kyler variance between two adjacent um, belief states and um, the evaluation in terms of um, the action. And um, for these regressors, of course, we have a number of electoral regressors in there, but for these regressors, we find that um, um, based on surprise of belief state updates, um, more strongly correlates with areas in the frontal parietal network, while um, the action valence that of the chosen action um, actually um, correlates more with um, activity in the ACG. Now, this was a, a quick run through um, of a typical project that we, um, where we use these agents to model human behavior and get closer to the implementation level. So I think we are doing, in terms of the computation level that my envision, we I think we're doing well with um, describing tasks uh, using partially observable Markov decision process models. Of course, there's no um, um, limit to imagination in terms of the algorithmic level. Um, of course, we are strongly influenced by Bayesian inference, so um, we have this in our model sets. Finally, I think where we are not that far as uh, we would like to be is um, the implementation level. So we have these correlations with uh, in terms of computational fMI, but really we don't have um, a model that based on neural constraints explains how a specific algorithm is implemented. And um, this is then, of course, something that uh, will relate to our future work. So uh, very briefly about what we envision to do in the future in terms of um, research. So on the one hand, in uh, functional new imaging data analysis, development and consolidation, we would like to continue our work in classical inference because there are a lot of things that actually need to be updated better in the run field theory work. And of course, we are the power that we here propose is not the only way you can compute power. So there is much more to do. We've done a lot of work in uh, variational inference, and there we also would like to continue this line of work and um, make it better and basically ask what are good um, um, estimators in variational inference. In computational cognitive neuroscience, uh, what we're currently working on is, of course, uh, using different paradigms, also computer games for which we have the source code and we can use our POMDP language to understand what's going on and formalize um, tasks, but also to go to um, the other end of uh, kind of the interesting stuff in terms of participants um, to investigate bandits because this uh, really focuses things on um, the, yeah, the important uh, concepts. And then the big task basically for the next 10 years or so will be to um, link um, the implementation of biophysical modeling that we have done, for example, for EG work with the algorithms that we are now considering um, to interact with these POMDPs. So, and with that, um, I think I'm um, done. 
So um, I've shown you um, two examples of how we use probabilistic models in functional neural imaging analysis, um, and um, um, one in how we use it in computational cognitive neuroscience. And um, after our discussion, uh, I, we will then discuss a little bit about uh, probabilistic models and statistical methods in machine learning. Thank you very much.